James is going to be eating this burger. Well, it's a burger and, I don't know, three quarters of a patty and some mushrooms and stuff. And we're going to be talking more about money and banking, what everyone should know. It's a great course. And um, well, we'll everyone should watch it. What everyone should know. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be supplementing. What was that? We'll be supplementing. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Uh, you got to so, know that there are yeah. people like him yeah, out there. Uh, what's going on, he's right? a scoundrel and a so, rascal. So mostly what I'm going to do is, don't worry about it, I'm going to read the notes uh, that I took while watching um, the great course. I'm going to start at lecture 25 because it really started to get interesting there. Hmm. And um, I guess well, it was more me. basic stuff. Uh, yeah. So um, it got more controversial as it went along. There's no I'm doubt about it. Not going to throw it. There will be. I'll probably throw in a few little tidbits, but I. James will be the one supplementing for the most part. No. So, if you're following along with the book, I'm on page 173. Asymmetric information. One party in a transaction has substantially more relevant knowledge than another. Often this relevant knowledge is about the quality of the product being bought or sold. Example, used cars. The buyer doesn't know which are lemons and which are cherries. The buyer will only buy at a price low enough to provide compensation for the risk of getting a lemon. Those with cherries are less likely to sell since they will receive less than the price for a cherry. Both bank loans and used car transactions suffer from the problem of asymmetric information. And the lecturer had um, tried to flip it around and say that um, they they don't know who they're lending to, like they're, the people are um, not necessarily trustworthy or whatever, right? And so the thing is, is that bankers are not trustworthy. They have a lot of information. You know they're not trustworthy because you know you can look at the interest rates and there's a serious discrepancy between how much you get for saving money with them and how much you get from borrowing from them. And it's not from them, it's from the people who are saving. So, anyway. So he does kind of like a switch and bait, you know, like how is uh, the lending market like uh, like buying a used car? And so as a as a consumer, you know, you're going, wow, yeah, I, I don't trust bankers, I don't trust used car salesmen. But then he's saying, Oh, poor bankers! They're yeah. they're like uh, someone buying a used car. They yeah. don't know what they're, you know, the, who they're lending to. They might never get the money back. Oh, poor bankers! They only get record profits every year, and so, record profits every year means it's jacking up. Oh, poor bankers! But we'll talk about that a little later. So, lecture twenty-six. Regulation of financial firms. When the government guarantees that a bank will not be allowed to fail, it creates an incentive for the bank to acquire assets that have higher expected returns but entail more risk. If the assets fail, the government caps the downside risk for the bank. So, yikes, right? And I mean, the government, that means us. So that's the... In a democracy, okay? Yeah, that's yeah. the Let's people. Let's make that clear. Mm -hmm. Because uh, he doesn't and, necessarily uh, make it clear. A lot of these... Uh, Apologists for business guys, they're going, and uh, you know, like, uh, we got to be free of government. I, uh, well no, no, our government helps keep us free if it's a democracy. Go ahead. We've been told that people generally pay more taxes than they are supposed to, than they're actually, because most people don't actually know about the loopholes that are available to them. And most people don't have time to look into, look this information up. And so most people can't afford to hire an accountant to do that for them. So who is paying more taxes than they should? That's not the really rich guys. Oh, they can afford an accountant to get them all the, all the loopholes. Let's look at Warren Buffett. Documentary. He's admitting that he pays 13% and he was complaining about it. There was another guy on this documentary was complaining about paying 8%. What Warren, Warren Buffett was complaining about was saying, it's too low. And you got this other guy, 8% is way too high. He's 
Buffett's a billionaire. This other guy uh, was at least a multimillionaire, I'd say. Eight. Eight percent. Bleh. Okay, so... Uh, page 181. Currently, deposit accounts are insured up to $100,000. Page 185. Lecture 27, subprime mortgage crisis and re-regulation. On September 28, 2008, the stock market suffered a loss higher than in 9-11. The Dow Jones dropped 504 points, or 4.4%. 4 and the market recorded a sales volume of more than 8 billion shares. Insurance company AIG had written many insurance contracts on mortgage backed derivative securities, and those in the market feared that these contracts would be worthless when AIG failed. Yep, because it didn't, okay. but anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. A CDO, collateralized debt obligation, is a derivative security that is issued against a portfolio of underlying securities, in this case mortgages. 189, some believe that crisis was caused by a long period of low interest rates in the U.S., the Federal Reserve had lowered interest rates over nine, after 9-11 to promote confidence in the U.S. in their financials, whatever. Okay. All right, Finish. before we move on. Okay, go ahead. Um, some conjecture this, some conjecture that. You know, like, I got interested, really interested in the economic system in the United States in 87, okay? I'd seen what happened in 81, 82 with the recession that was brought on by monetary policy, the kind of stuff that this guy's an apologist for. And uh, 87, biggest stock market crash since 1929. I don't have to tell you how serious 29 was. And what happened is the economy didn't tank because what happened is people were able to move their assets from the stock market into the real estate market. And then that started to crash, and uh, you know, like uh, you got a um, an economic burnout. What they did, what happened was then when they shifted over to uh, uh, real estate market, is they were able to delay it for four, roughly four years, and then in uh, 90, 91, 91, we'll say they had another recession. Okay, and. Uh, um, you know, like, uh, this stuff is predictable. 87, I was buying Wall Street journals, and that was expensive. Expensive, because it wasn't rack price. It was, uh, you know, like what you get in New York or even in the United States. I'd be getting it at some uh, cigar store or something like that. I can't remember what it was. And it, I paid a fortune for it. But uh, I learned a lot and uh, stuff like that, a lot more than this guy learned. And, you know, like I'm going along, they don't know how to handle the system. What they will do is they're fighting inflation. Woo, yeah. The big Mike Tysons of the world, right? The financial world. And they bring on a recession in 81. And they bring on a recession in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2001 with Bush baby. And they, uh, they, uh, they keep on bringing on recessions to fight inflation. But then what happens, and it's always the Republicans, always. And what, in other words, right-wingers. And what happens is, you know, we've got our hands on the lever. Uh, we're fighting inflation. And then all of a sudden, you know, like at the end of the Republican shift, the, 2008, it, you know, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be monetary policy. It's the Republicans. And the sleazy, slimy, it's, it's what I call legal, legalized corruption. They will legalize what has been corruption, and it's never enough for them. Look at the slime buckets in 87. Was that 87 Michael Milken and all that sort of stuff? Because it's never enough. They always go, it's, it's like, uh, hey, we got the corruption, but it's... Hey, look at the pot at the end of the rainbow. They keep moving towards it. So 2008, we've got our hands on the lever. What, 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 what's happening? Yeah, you guys are brain dead. The lever's in your head, and you got no brains, including this idiot. Go ahead. Well, yeah. Um, Short-term greed, and... Uh, long term, it's it's a uh, folly, really, because if to, if you take too much, mm. 
then then you can't take it anymore once it falls apart, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, that's one of the big problems, of course, with uh, economic inequality. You know, it reached a, a high in 2008 that had uh, had it hadn't reached since 1929. What are the similarities between those two days? Do you well, know that? So uh, what you're doing is you're producing you these goods, the and you've you've taken away uh, the people's uh, ability to buy those goods. Produce, produce, produce. Buy my goods, Madison okay, Avenue. Are you going to talk so about the glass ceiling? Yeah, exactly. Oh, glass ceiling or glass steagle? Siegel, Siegel. Is that okay. what it's called? No. Are you yeah? sure? Oh, well, I'll talk about it. Sure. Okay. 1933. What's significant about that? Well, it's the end of the Depression. Don't let right-wingers fool you and say that, and left-wingers too, Marxists, what ended the Depression is World War II and the spending on World War II. Look at the stats, you stupid full lefties who say that, and you stupid right-wingers who say that FDR extended the recession. The stats don't agree with either of your theses. A plague, a pox, a COVID-19 on both of your houses, you lying hounds. Okay, okay? I... so what happens is 1929, fall of, steep fall. And it keeps going and going. This is under Herbert Hoover, a Republican. And then, then, early 33, who gets elected there? FDR. <coughs> and it goes up, up, up. It's gone in the toilet. And it goes up, up, up. <coughs> Understand, the peak that was hit in 1929 was hit around the end of World War I. It wasn't a huge peak all by itself. The stock market was, but the economy wasn't. Look at the stats, you morons, oxymorons. You're sharp, but you're dull, okay? So 1918, roughly the same level as 1929. Now, so, and what actually happened is there were two recessions, they were called depressions back then, in, yeah. in, in yeah, the, the 20s. Yeah, it's changed, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's a, it's a, um, what do you call it? It's double speak. It's yellow speak. Yeah. Now, understand, I get this out of Milton Friedman's little uh, screed written. Oh, it's not little. It's 1963. And I've gone through it all, including the footnotes and including the charts at the back, okay? So it's you right-wingers say, whoa, he's go working with cooked uh, stats. No freaking way. If it's cooked, it's cooked in your direction by Milton Friedman. Okay? You read that book. Don't go around, you know, like, woo hoo 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 We know what we're doing. We don't have to read anything, okay? Well, I don't know what that thing's called. The glass whatever. Okay, glass. And, I think it's Steagall or C anyway, Steagall. But anyway, it was a policy. Brought in by FDR. Yeah. And what it is, it's early 19, or sometime in 33, and it just regulates banks. Yeah. And basically it said something like banks couldn't be... Uh, you know, they couldn't uh, get involved in things like stock market and stuff like that. Separation. Okay. And then it they took out the regulation. In 1999. And within less than 10 years, huge troubles. Wow. Now we're dealing with a small sample. We're only dealing kind of like with two things or whatever, two uh, crashes. But the thing is, so technically, you know, like I can't say it's proven or anything like that, but why would you bet against it until you get other data that goes against the thesis? Mm -hmm. You don't put all your money in the basket. So 1999, uh, they t uh, took it back. Now let me think if I can reconstruct uh, who the idiots were who backed it. Bliley, Leach, and Graham. Graham, Leach, Bliley. How's that for... Thank you. Uh, for, uh, because is I, that I what you had that down? Might actually come. I didn't write that down in my notes, but I thought. But that, might that be basically useful. got rid of that. Okay. And then within uh, less than ten years, you've got a huge stock market crash, the biggest since uh, 1929. Wow! Is that a coincidence? Is that a coinky dink or what? So, anyway. when the U.S. has a current account deficit, other nations have a surplus of U.S. dollars to purchase financial assets. Page 190, typo, too big to fail. In the first paragraph, it was a uh, two was not not big enough. 
Well, <laughs> and this happens. I mean, and one of my. He wrote it correctly. But I mean, it's a great I course. There's a couple mistake yeah. typos in here, and it's like it's a great course. Yeah, I know, I know. But the deal okay. is, you'll get stuff from Oxford yeah. University Press, yeah, Cambridge University Press, a little less perhaps. And there'll be titles, there'll be mistakes on the map. I'll pick the, the, the stuff in my head, in the maps. I'll look at it. How hard is it to get the maps that you get in regular books? I'm not talking about atlases. Are pretty simple. Get okay, someone to that. actually okay. copy edit your maps, but also your text. Oxford University Press. This is a little call out to you guys. Okay. Shout out or whatever so, it is. I don't know where this was, I wrote in the margin, his example of teen not saving for computer really compares the bank users to children and bankers to responsible knowing father. It's offensive. Uh, paternalistic, and, pet, patriarchal, yeah. all those pater words and that go back to the yeah. patronizing, Let's the Latin 20, word for father. Father knows best. Interest rate policy at the federal and at the Fed and ECB. By U.S. law, depository institutions must hold reserves, 10% of demand deposits. When the Fed wants to decrease the Fed funds rate, it buys U.S. Treasury securities on the open market from private dealers. New federal funds are created this way, and those funds allow commercial banks to loan 10 new dollars for every one new dollar in federal funds. Lecture 29. The Objectives of Monetary Policy. Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke uh, think deliberate bubble bursting should be avoided by government. Others believe that letting the housing bubble burst on its own led to the subprime mortgage crisis. CPI inflation is the result of the Fed allowing the economy to heat up while the bubble inflates, then trying to keep it from fully cooling after the bubble burst. So can I talk yep. a little bit? Okay. So the reason why bubbles happen is because of uh, not enough regulation and uh, and uh, the economy not growing. So this is what happened in the 50s. Good good time, you know, like the the econ the uh, stock market actually hadn't done well between uh, 1929 and the early 50s. Did you know that? I don't think it um, it wasn't until maybe uh, 1960 that it reached the same level it had been in 1929. That's 30 years, a whole generation. People were scared of the stock market, and I would have been too, when it was run by a bunch of sleaze buckets like the Republicans and like uh, corporations and stuff like that. Understand, I've been uh, taking faux lefties to task. I've been taking not faux uh, right, right wingers uh, to task not enough. And <laughs> you're going to get an earful, you right wingers. Anyway, uh, so uh, the reason why it uh, got back up to the level was, you know. Eisenhower in the 50s, eight years of the, well, seven years of the 50s in 1960. He was in there and, uh, oh, it's a gung-ho businessman. They were down on intellectuals. Now, I'm down a lot of intellectuals, faux intellectuals and stuff like that. But, uh, uh, you know, like it was stupid. They hated eggheads. It, they hated my guts. But uh, they hated a lot of people, you know, like uh, Lillian Hellman and uh, Dashiell Hammett. Their guts were hateful. So, at any rate. Um, so the stock market, uh, there was a bubble there. Why? You see, you got to know the stats. The stats. Now, understand, I, I, I was talking to a right-wing political economist, okay? I'm not saying where he was, what institution he's associated with, but I presume he's got a PhD, and I think he's a full professor. Thank you. Now, he didn't know, he, he was saying that, and so I said, well, you know, like I was looking at the, I wanted to see what he knew, right? I just wanted to discuss the things. And so I said, how many recessions there have been in the United States since the late 40s? Didn't know. Say what? I don't know how many political science courses I've taken in my life. We'll say three at the most. But I think it's only two. Economics courses, four. And I know more than he does about his specialty. I said, which, where, when? Well, let's count through them. And count them up. He didn't know the individual ones. Say what, dude? I pay your wages. And you don't know? No, I should have been just lambasting his ears like this. But he didn't know. I knew better than him. And that's not my specialty. My specialty, I guess, when it comes to that, is 
knowing what I should know in order to vote. Now understand all you guys and gals out there or whatever, if you're offended by gal, all you people out there should know as much as I do about this stuff. There's no excuse. This stuff's available out there and you'd better know about it, but you don't. <coughs> That's right wing, left wing, center, up, down. Some of you might know, but the <laughs> run of the mill doesn't know. So you, when else do you get bubbles? No, Clinton actually had <coughs> a bubble. It's unusual for the Democrats to have a bubble. Why? Because the Democrats grow the economy. Okay? That's been their history since 1933. Check it out. I'm not dreaming this in technicolor. Like, I'm not a typical faux left winger. I actually look at the stats, okay? And you right wingers, I don't know where your where your skulls are at. I'm not going to say where I think they are. But uh, yeah, and the Democrats have grown the economy since 1933. Very few exceptions. You know, like you know, like 1937. I think there was one right after World War II, and it's understood that uh, they were retooling. You know, like how many cars did the, uh, did Detroit produce in 1944? Do you know, like passenger vehicles? It's in the hundreds. And it's the, if I'm not mistaken, the low hundreds. And yes, I have checked the stats. And, you know, like if you want to retool, retooling is like you're, you're going to have to go back to, from producing tanks and whatever to producing cars. And that's going to cost you a little bit in the economy. So, yeah, they had a downturn right after the end of World War II. I can explain what happened in 37. FDR got re-elected and he said, hey, people are calling me a commie and they're going out, literally, they're shooting to kill. They're trying to kill me. They're trying to assassinate me. I, You know, he's a fairly pragmatic kind of guy. He says, okay, I'm going to try right-wing policy. And then all of a sudden, woo, you should see that. Woo, just what had happened in 33. they just gone rocketing up using left-wing policies. Then they try right-wing policies. Woo, yeah. And he was pragmatic enough. He just said, okay, we're going to go back to what worked. And, yeah, I didn't finish that, you know, like, because I'm annoyed with this. Okay, so if you look what happened, this is important. 1918, high, peak. 1929, a little bit more. But it's basically the same. I'm not talking about the stock market. That stock market was a bubble in 29. The actual economy didn't get much over what was in 1918 minuscule difference then there's this huge drop off into the toilet it's like it's got flushed right down into the sewer and it it the fdr takes over and right away you'll get right when you're saying the economy was turning around no it wasn't it was going in the toilet the stats actually show it there's a point at the end of 1932 and then it goes up 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 you are liars. Okay. And then it goes like this, 37. It goes into the toilet, but it's very, very short. When you're looking at these sorts of things, what you have to look is how much suffering actually happens. In other words, how deep does it go, but actually how long it is too. This thing from 29, late 29, to the beginning of 1933 was deep and it was wide. And the bottom line, is what you do is you look at life expectancy. You actually see a drop off in life expectancy in that period. And that's on Herbert Hoover and the Republicans. 37, FDR was a pragmatist. And he goes, this ain't working. I'm going to go back to what worked. And so it goes like this, like this, like this. And then you look at it. It's exactly, it's the same curve. Only what happens is in the middle, you got this huge spike downwards. And then what happens in 1939, 40? Because the war really doesn't get cooking until 40. So we're going to say 40. People are saying, hey, they were producing tanks for Europe and stuff like that. And that's what brought the economy back. Where was it in 1940? The same level, a little bit lower, but the same level it was in 1929 and in 1918. You see what FDR did? Huge, heroic 
political, economic feat. And then what he did. I don't have to tell you what he did in World War II. And that was a political, economic feat. He defeated the, the Germans and the Japanese just wham, wham, wham in a few years, 41 to 45. Less than five years. They were a huge threat. And he, he just took care of them. So, uh, I don't know. I think I've exhausted myself, if not the, to the topic. I'm freaking annoyed at this guy. Are we out of battery? I, I don't know. I'm going to no. see where we are. Okay, you have five minutes. Five so minutes, okay. Talk we'll, we'll talk so, more. There's a lot more to talk about this guy. Go lecture on. 30. Should central banks follow a policy rule? In 2008, the TED spread spiked. The Fed normally only loans to depository institutions through its discount window. In March 2008, the Fed created two programs to provide short-term sec secured loans to securities dealers, similar to discount window loans. In the fall of 2008, the Fed intervened to improve credit conditions in two markets, money market mutual funds and the commercial paper market. Money market mutual funds pool funds from savers and use them to make short-term loans and businesses, or to businesses. The commercial paper market is a source of short-term loans that businesses rely on. Now, I wanted to mention something. He, uh, in lecture 30, so I forgot to mention this, he um, explains um, an equation that he shows on the, on the screen. And so I wrote all the all the things down and this is where I really got to think oh my gosh like my spidey sense was going up yeah, yeah. and I got <laughs> to think wow or whatever it yeah. sounds like because, go ahead um, he's using symbols like pi pi is a universal constant but he's not using it as pi so if you look at the equations it looks more concrete because of the symbols that are being used which are concrete no symbols for concrete sort of things. Do you see what I'm saying? But they they're not um, concrete at all, and they're not the same. Now I, I don't think that's his own. No. Practice. But, it but needs economists to stop, stop because using pi use for the rate of inflation. You stupid yeah. idiots. You what are you a thinking of? Symbol there are all sorts of symbols. It, there, or, there, <laughs> there are or Egyptian hieroglyph symbols. But use something different. Stupid something oxymorons. To that, then, because you can make up all sorts of symbols. It doesn't Stupid. have to be. Stupid. Yeah, you could do something from abstract. Are you that? Something. Anyway. Dull? I mean, you're showing all sorts of imagination. Let's do a thought experiment. And literally, it's he not, does do lo thought experiments, yes, right? A lot of them. Let's do a and thought experiment. It's not done like you may think oh well they didn't have many symbols to use and they it wasn't useful you know pi as 3.14 blah 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 use the so sanskrit symbols in, in uh, economics so they just decided oh, okay well we'll use that as something else or whatever but no it is actually a way to um persuade through lies Hmm. And it's, like, it's we done on purpose. really know mathematics. So, um, wow. anyway, lecture 31. Many think the Fed provided too much stimulus during the Great Recession. And I want to bring this up. He says, what's known as the, what we know, what we call the Great Recession. And it's like, what? Nobody calls it the Great Recession. Everybody calls it the Great Depression. And well, no, the Great Depression is in the 30s, right? Yeah, but he was talking about the Great Recession. Depression as the Great Recession. He's talking about what happened in 2008, as I understand, as the Great Recession. I don't think Maybe so. Maybe not. Okay. 